Although the vast majority of us may flinch when hearing the buzzing of a bee nearby, there is no doubt that these fly insects have been incredibly useful to the human race, even before the release of the bee movie back in 2007. And with World Bee Day just a couple of months away, supporters of the little creatures may be looking for a way to celebrate. But what do we really know about these tiny insects we share the earth with? Well, whether you consider yourself to be a fan of bees or you just want to know more about the insectoids that have been known to bring us the nectar of the gods, stay right where you are, as we're going to explore everything there is to know about the little buzzers. So strap yourselves in and get ready for an informative flight, as things are going to get interesting. But before we get into it, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe with notifications turned on so you never miss another update from us. Their relation to wasps. We know that the vast majority of children are taught to be afraid of flying insects, due to the small chance that a sting or even a bite could result in an allergic reaction. And since this fear is often carried over into adulthood, it's no wonder that many people flee when they hear a buzzing in the air. Although the two insects do appear to be quite similar to one another, humans are far more terrified of wasps than they ever are of bees. This is most likely because of the rate at which a wasp is able to sting another creature. You see, once a bee stings someone or something, its stinger detaches from its body and it ends up dying as a result. A wasp, on the other hand, has the ability to sting someone or something multiple times. So while there is a chance that you might feel a sting from a bee, there's an even greater chance that you'll be faced with multiple stings from a wasp. And considering how some wasps, like the tarantula hop for example, have an incredibly painful sting, this fear makes absolute sense. But did you know that, technically speaking, bees are nothing more than wasps that have evolved to feed on pollen? The ancestor of all modern bees, as far as the experts can tell, is actually a very small wasp which fed on a type of insect called a thrip, which is known to feed on pollen to survive. At some point over the 100 million years, descendants of this wasp decided to cut the middleman out developing to be able to feed on pollen directly. This method of direct feeding then resulted in the insects becoming a lot bigger and hairier. After even more development, the insects were then able to feed this pollen directly to their larvae, which caused them to develop the ability to trap and collect pollen using their hind legs. Finally, after years of taking part in this new direct method of feeding, the small wasp of yesteryear was replaced by the bees that now tend to roam the world alongside us. We also got to remember this is far from just a theory, as some creationists might concur when hearing about this transition. In fact, there's at least two transitional fossils that do bridge the gap between bees and wasps, with both of them being over 100 million years old. These species have been given the names Discoscuba and Meltitophex, respectively, and are considered to be the missing links that were found between the transition from small wasps to big. While on the topic, you might be also interested to hear that ants are also, technically speaking, derived from wasps as well. Evolution is absolutely wonderful, and creationists are a bunch of idiots. The World of Bees Although you are probably aware of just a few species of bees ranging from a queen to a honeybee, there's over 20,000 species of bees in the world today. And while it may be true that a new species of bee is discovered almost on a yearly basis, the same rate of extinction exists among the general bee population. This means that the number of bee species around at particular times remains somewhere in the 20,000 range, regardless of how many new species are discovered. This also means that we can never be truly certain in respect of the exact number of bee species which exist on planet Earth. Contrary to popular belief, there is also no species of bee which is aggressive toward humans. There's a small number of bees that have defensive behaviors. A good example of a class such as this would be the honeybee, which have been known to attack anything that threatens their nests. This might include a bear, honey badger, raccoon, bird, skunk, or curious human. In other words, while no species of bee will go out of its way to attack you when hiking through the forest, keep an eye out for their nests and hives, as disrupting one could have some terrifying consequences. Lastly, when it comes to being stung by any species of bee, Statistics point to the fact that, more often than not, the sting is a result of an accidental release. In layman's terms, most people who are stung by bees are stung by accidentally stinging or placing their hands on top of the insects, squishing them as a result. When this happens, the bee's body will often act reflexively, stinging whatever is crushing it as a final revenge to the creature. And while the majority of stings can be treated by removing the appendages from the skin and drinking some sugar water, 
the honeybee is considered to be an exception. This is why people working with these bees will often have to wear special protective suits, as a couple of rapid stings from a cluster of honeybees could be life-threatening. Conservation Efforts to Save the Bees For the last couple of years, there have been a steady decline in the population of honeybees, which can be found all across the world. And although this might not sound bad, considering how dangerous these little creatures can be, the disappearance of these insectoids could bring with it a far more reaching horrible consequence. This is why many experts in the field have been working towards the conservation of areas to help support honeybees and to stop them from going extinct. If you ever wanted to know how you could help in stopping the process, it really depends on where you live. If you live in the United States, Canada, or Mexico, then there is nothing you should be doing to help the honeybees in your country from going extinct. This is simply because honeybees aren't actually native to those countries and only exist there under the strict protection and care of qualified beekeepers. Like a chicken or sheep, these honeybees are considered to be a form of domesticated animal used in agriculture for the production of their byproduct, honey. The effect of these honeybees could have on their native population is terrifying, which is why they're kept under lock and key. More specifically, if let loose, they could consume the food meant for bees native to the region and help spread invasive weeds that native pollinators aren't able to pollinate. If you live in Europe, however, honeybees are considered to be native and thus require all the help that you can offer when it does come to saving them from extinction. The first step in protecting these little darling creatures is to protect their habitat by reducing pesticide use outside of very limited areas of farmland. There's also many resources available to us to attract a diversity of bees to our very own gardens. It's similar in the way that whenever you set up a bird bath, you will bring out a large selection of birds to your own little oasis. In order to see which plants can be planted in your specific region, head on over to the Pollinator Partnership website, as this will give you a list of pollinator plants that you can select according to your specific zip code. The Creation of Honey We all know that honeybees are most famous for the creation of honey, which we all like to eat every now and again on a nice slice of warm toast. What the vast majority of the public doesn't know, however, is the reason why honeybees actually make this honey in their hives. Unlike the many other species of bees that exist in the world, honeybees tend to live for a number of years at a time. And the simple truth of the matter is that there are many points in a year where there are very few to no flowers out and about. Since honeybees feed on pollen, and pollen does come from flowers, this can be quite problematic for the continued existence. So, in order to get through the times where there's little to no flowers around, honeybees tend to store the nectar that they've already collected, very similar to how a beer would store food before hibernation. It is within this storing process that converts the pollen to honey. Strangely enough, there are other bees, like bumblebees and stingless honeybees, that tend to store pollen over large periods of time, allowing for the pollen to be converted into a honey-like substance. The substance is, however, much closer to raw nectar than it is to sweetened honey, making honeybees the best in the business when it comes to the creation of the condiment. Is buying and consuming honey bad for bees? Since conservationists have developed a knack for going overboard when it comes to their passion for conservation, you might have heard that both buying and consuming honey is bad for the population of bees we have. The truth of the matter is that honeybees have been domesticated for thousands of years now, and in fact, humans have gotten so good at domesticating honeybees that we've been able to use artificial selection so as to increase the amount of honey that these bees end up storing. Since honeybees have been moved all over the world due to this process of domestication, it can also be stated that they have benefited from it. The beekeeper in question ensures that they are sufficiently looked after so that way they can provide them with a nice selection of honey, causing them to be better off than those flying in the wild and not having a sufficient amount of flowers to pollinate. In other words, it's not true that the buying and consuming of honey is bad for bees. There is a greater argument that these actions have actually resulted in the saving of the species, with more and more beekeepers wanting a colony of their own. Is honey healthy for humans? Last but not least, another myth that you're probably tired of hearing is that honey is healthy. While that is true to some extent, with Manuka honey having antimicrobial properties and honey in general having plant properties that are good for us, it's also high in a quantity of carbs. So in other words, too much of it can be bad for you in the long run. So, which fact was your favorite? 
Let us know in the comment section down below. And again, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and hit that post notification bell for more content just like this. Until next time, guys, we'll see you later.